Well, this is one that I've been looking forward to, Mr. Rob Ford from Harcourts Coastal in Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia. Um, Rob helps run one of the best real estate offices in all of Australia, the best individual office, I should say. Um, And it's the number one auction business within the entire country as well. Um, It is a incredible journey that Rob has been on also that he gets to share. Rob was previously the CEO of Harcourts in North America, um, as well as owning and operating his own business. He was a CEO of one of the states, being New South Wales for Harcourts also, and then also some other roles that he had within South Australia that he alludes to. So we talk about decision making, but then we talk about the parallels between Australian and North American real estate. We talk about the auction process in a little bit more detail and some incredible insights to somebody running quite literally the best real estate office, I would say, almost in the world with some of the numbers that are coming out of that business. So it was some really great insights with Mr. Rob Ford. Hope you enjoy. Just a quick little disclaimer on this episode. At the very beginning, you won't see Rob if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, we had some d- technical difficulties with his camera, but either way, if you're listening on audio, it's absolutely perfect. Um, but either way, folks, is that this is a great episode. Thanks so much. Welcome to Rethink Real Estate. My name is Ben Brady, and this is a real estate podcast aimed to deliver sales strategies, marketing tips, and business insights from industry experts and myself to build a listing-focused business for the future. Let's get into it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Mr. Rob Ford. How are you today, Rob? I'm very well, Benny. How are you, mate? I'm good, mate. I'm good. Now, Folks, for those of you that don't know, is that uh, Rob was technically an American for, what are we saying, four years, five years? No, it was just under four. Yeah, just under four years. Oh, I, thought it was, I thought it was a strong I thought it was a strong five. Yeah, no, it might, might have felt like that, my presence over there with you, but uh, no, it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't, wasn't quite that long. For those that don't know, Rob's a pretty big deal over here. He's like pretty massive. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but one of the things, so Calista and I, the other night were sitting back and reminiscing, um, because we were talking, we said, oh no, we got to see Georgie. We hadn't seen Georgie in a long time at the annual awards for Harcourts the other night. It's like, yeah, yeah. When was the last time we see- saw Georgie? I'm like, oh, probably drunk at your apartment on the beach in Newport. Oh, <laughs> there was, uh, there was definitely some, some fun nights there. That's for sure. Some very fond memories. We're actually talking where, um, we're really keen to get back over just to, uh, to see everyone. We've got, yeah, so many you know, fond memories of over there. And it was, um, it's a pretty special place. That's for sure. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a good, it's a good part of the world, but uh, folks, if you, uh, for those that are listening and just Rob needs to build some credibility instantaneously, can do a keg stand. Just saying. <laughs> Alex Duke was the uh, main instigator behind that. And uh, yeah, he set the record that day. That's for sure. Oh, <laughs> unbelievable. But uh, but either way, Rob, thanks for joining us on Rethink Real Estate, mate. It's been a um one of the reasons that we wanted to have you on today is not only because of the the tremendous business that you're running now back in Australia, being one of the be- well the best auction business in the country, um, as far as I'm concerned, but also the best real estate office hands down in the country categorically. But it's really so far your journey through your real estate career that is probably the most insightful for people that are listening because I think that it's fair enough to say that you've seen a multitude of different marketplaces, not only within Australia, but internationally as well, having worked for Harcourts International, but then having a really good understanding of the North American market where a lot of our audience is, um, Mm -hmm. is that I think that you'll be able to draw some parallels to what are great things about the real estate industry here in North America, but also, you know, what Australia has the leg up in perspective in in that sense and see if people can bring it into their business but it all started somewhere mate where did you start your real estate career well i um it's funny the old man was in real estate I actually started as a stock and station agent so selling livestock um and then that sort of transitioned into rural properties and and farms and and different things and i i thought that um because he was in the industry i would do something completely different um, and uh, went off to, to university and did a double degree in international business and international studies and had a passion for wine because I grew up in, a, in the wine industry. Um, started selling some wine for a guy at the time that owned, um, the, you know, so one of the biggest franchise groups here in, uh, in Oz. Um, and he had a license agreement with them in South Australia. And so I ended up selling wine for him while I was finishing uni and then also working as sort of um, in doing research and data um, with um, with Ray White, South Australia, Northern Territory. Um, spent some time, um, probably, I think I was there for about four years, 
um, yeah. under under Nick George, who was a um, you know been a been a great mentor and certainly someone that I uh, have got a lot of wisdom from. And he ran an unbelievable volume based business in in South Australia. Um, I um, while I was there with Nick, sort of went from research and data, and then started and got into to doing auctions. I, I thought that you know as a way for me to add a lot more value to the network would be having that firsthand sort of understanding of, of being at the coalface, running campaigns, auctions and, and doing that. So I, I started doing that and within a couple of years, was sort of doing a, a majority of the auctions for the network in, in South Australia. Um, I then um, had uh, Brian Thompson, another great uh, real estate legend who's over in with Harcourts New Zealand. He was running the Australasian business for Harcourts at that stage. Um, I started chatting with Brian about an opportunity for um, Harcourts as the CEO in uh, New South Wales, uh, in Sydney, and as a uh, as a young young guy, that was a pretty uh, attractive opportunity to to go over and and sort of fly the flag in Sydney. So, um, spent almost four years in Sydney. I did have a stint where so after about three years, um, sort of with the franchise group, I, I went over and I had an opportunity to go in as a partner in an office in the Lower North Shore of Sydney. Um, went in and did that for, it was only probably about nine months. And there was a couple of things with probably timing undercapitalized and not, um, the, the partnership that I went into wasn't the partnership that we, you know, it just didn't, it wasn't the right fit. Um, so made the decision, um, around that, that wasn't the path I was sort of, or the journey that I was, I was going to take. And, and around that time, uh, Mike Green, um, who had been talking to me, said, well, there's an opportunity coming up in, in North America. Um, and I'd seen that, Ben, you'd been over there for, I don't know, probably one or two years maybe before um, before I came over and, and you know, we're sort yeah. of doing some, starting to do some good things. So that looked like a, um, you know, a pretty exciting, exciting journey. So I spoke with you, obviously, through that through that process and, and ended up coming over um, as the regional director for, uh, for Harcourt's uh, North America, so essentially looking after California, Nevada, Hawaii, um, which was um, you know which was which was pretty awesome. So it was it was cool to see the way that auction was kind of uh, you know transitioning and and growing and um, you know definitely definitely challenges that came with being a uh, a smaller player um, in a in a big market, but also there was opportunities that came with that as well with sort of being nimble and it shows a lot by um, and and you know this better than anyone, but when you believe in something and have a, an energy and a hunger and a desire and passion, um, it's amazing what people um, will buy into and, you know, want to be a part of that journey. So that was, um, that was really cool to be really cool to be a part of. Um, yeah. From there, Georgie and I, my wife were keen to, uh, keen to come back uh, to Australia at some point and the opportunity came up as the COO for Harcourts uh, International, which is based in Brisbane in the head office. Um, so that was sort of overseeing um, and, and working with the eight different countries uh, at that point in time. So trips back to America, so I had that connection there, which was great. Uh, and then also over to Indo, um, China, had one of the funniest experiences of my life going to two days of um, Harcourts China conferences. Um, we'll with- unpack that. We'll unpack that later. Anyway, keep going. It was, um, it was different. Um, yeah, different. Um, and, and South Africa had a couple of great trips over there, um, with, uh, with Richard Gray and, and the team, which was, which was really cool. And sort of, so that was, that was a really, that was a really cool role for a couple of years through that. Um, I'd been talking to, I mean, I'd known Dane back from the Ray White, um, Adelaide, uh, days. Um, so Dane Atherton, who's, um, director, founder of, um, Harcourts Coastal, he um he was doing Athenian coaching and um, auctioneering, and he came and did a session for us at Ray White in South Australia. So that's where that connection sort of started, and we'd always kind of um, spoken. I'd always thought if there was ever an opportunity to go into business with someone on a you know on a real estate business level, it would be it would be Dane. Um, and through talking when I was back in Brisbane, obviously Gold Coast is just, you know, down the road. So we'd been in conversations for, for a little while and, and then timing sort of um, lined up and the opportunity to come down is into my current role now, which is which is sales director um, with Harcourts Coastal and um, a partner in the business, which is, um, you know, which is really good. So I've um, been doing that now for, for about three years. Isn't that interesting, mate, how it's come full circle? Like it's it's interesting how you've sort of come all the way back into the real estate business and into the ownership side of it, into running the team and all of that type of stuff. When, you know, I you know, it's funny when you're in the corporate world of this is that you think you'll be here forever, but ultimately you don't 
you don't end up being there forever. Like, I guess that my first question in all of that, mate, is that, you know, you have had some trial and tribulation amongst that. It hasn't all been incredible success. Yeah. Um, you know, with the, you know, the office that you went into and everything along those lines, there's got to be incredible learning there, mate. Like, like, could you probably share with everybody at that point in time, because, you're you're um the same age as i am we're relatively young individuals so realistically is that at that time if that had happened to me i would have thought that oh i'm fucked i'm just i'm out like what's yeah. going on here but yet you managed to sort of push forward through that can you just go through some workings in that rob yeah so my whole mindset and going was probably off the back of seeing what dane was doing at that stage with harcourt's coast or on the gold coast that you know prompted me to go into that business in in the lower north shore um my ambition and my goal had always been you know from my um sort of a lot of leadership sort of training and through university and then also in those leadership roles at a young age but my passion had always been around leading whether it be a business or people and and in going into that business i was pulled a lot into the sales side of things which isn't a bad thing and, and sales um obviously i mean i love sales people now i mean that's that's um our business and i love working like the the energy that you get around working with people that uh you know that they're, they're everything they're doing is around the deal and getting a deal done and you know if they're not making sales and not earning money so there's there's a real energy that i just love being a part of which is which is um agents sales people um for me that wasn't the journey that i was wanting in mossman and i got to a point there where it was either having to um probably i'd, I'd put a fair bit I'd, I'd saved up a bit to to go into that business um and i'd put all of that in and then it was a case of looking that i was going to have to take out some probably serious loans to fund something that i didn't believe deep down was what i wanted to do um yeah. so for me that was a pretty easy choice because it wasn't and i knew that the direction that i was going to have to take wasn't going to be where aligned with what i wanted to do and to me that was made it made it easy to um to make that um you know to make that transition so that was so for me that was a I mean a big learning in that was you need to you need to do what you're passionate about and and for me that was was pretty clear um and and it just so happened that it aligned with an opportunity um you know to go and do something which was pretty exciting over in the states so if that hadn't have been there I'm not sure the decision I would have made I may have chosen to just grind it out there and I'm not sure but yeah that to me there was a sort of that was a bit of a sliding doors moment I guess if you like and and I'm pleased that it came because it, it made me really clear about what it I, what I wanted to do and um you know going forward has has led me to this position which is um ultimately where I want to be because gut decision comes into a lot of the stuff that you've done mate by like like at the end of the day you've had to really trust your trust a bit of momentum that you've had you've had to trust your own instincts in all of this as well decision making is one of the most difficult things that i see most people in the real estate profession you know do on a daily basis like do i go and prospect that area or do i go into that business do i stay in my brokerage or do i stay in my company that i'm in at the moment you know do i join that team do i do what this is could you help us with a little bit of decision making side of it mate you've made a lot more decisions in your life than what most people will probably make from a professional standpoint um across their entire career so when it comes to the decision making do you have anything that you do do you have a gut check that you do is there anything that you 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 i always you, like that um you know I, I watched that um steve jobs commencement uh speech at stanford that he did and then it was yep. you know you can never connect the dots looking forward only looking back and sort of where you've career and what's led you to a point um and he also said in that that unless you're really sure on where you want to be don't settle um i always knew that i wanted to have some sort of um ownership in a business that was always where i was kind of driven to be um and and that was um and and it was just finding the whether it be myself or with someone else i did learn as well it was um adrian mcfedry's actually said to me once um that not all people are startup people, that some people, there's a lot of people that are really great in the startup business and, and get things going. And there are some people that are great coming into a business and helping it grow. And I'd never sort of heard of that or thought about that. I thought it was all, and probably in real estate, you kind of look at it and a lot of it is startup through, you know, grinding or an agent that then transition into ownership and different skill sets along the way. And, and to me, that was, um, 
it was clear that I didn't have to start it on my own, but I wanted to do it with someone. I always, you yeah. know, I, I sort of feed off the energy of other people and wanting to be around a, a you know, a good quality group. Um, so that was, um, so that, that, that made it pretty easy for me in sort of looking at that decision or, or where that was. I knew, I knew sort of long-term what I wanted. Um, and it was just trying to find that right opportunity that sort of, um, that aligned and, and made that work. And I think the good thing is, I mean, having, um, you know, it's almost been, I don't know, it was 2012, I think, or 2011 that I got into real estate. So it's been a diverse sort of look at the industry, um, but to me, the I mean, what makes this business work is what happens on the ground. And I, I'd, I'd get a lot of energy at the speed at which things happen. And again, being around agents every day and, and going through deals and, you know, now, you know, sort of working with auctions and seeing different people's scenarios and what's happening and, you know, lending a hand and trying to help out and guide people through is um, there's actually a lot of fulfillment that comes with that. So that mm. that to me is a um, is a really good thing. And I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm stoked that I'm... Uh, you know, landed where I have. So mate, you, you picked up your stuff and, and at the end of the day, I think that when you move internally within Australia, with internally in within companies and things along those lines, I think it's, it's a big decision, but it's less of a big decision when there's no big country move that ultimately mm. is there, there, then the hurdle that stands in that way. Sorry to interrupt the podcast, but wanted to ask a quick favor. If you're seeing any value in what we're providing, we'd love it if you could like, follow, or subscribe, whether you're listening on a podcast or watching us on YouTube. One step further is that if you can think of anybody in your community that this episode could help, we'd love it if you could share it to them so we could cast our message further and broaden our audience. Thanks again. So, mate, when you moved to the US, you and Georgie, like, you came over here. Like, I know you wanted to return to Australia eventually and whatever it may be, but you guys made a pretty serious commitment to be here long term. Yeah, well, we um, we kind of had to. We, um, you know, financially, it was there wasn't an option to go over and try. Like, I really wanted to make sure, and I knew that after, you know, the experience I'd sort of had leading up to that, I really wanted to make a go of something and, and make it work. Um, and, and it was a hell of a challenge. I mean, coming over into the, into the U S and I don't know if it was part of you, but, um, when we got there and taking us to, with Bob Wolf to all the hot spots at Dana point, I was like, oh, this place is amazing. And then, uh, and then we got in and, and rubber hit the road and, and, but it was, I mean, it was a great challenge and it was something that I, I really enjoyed. And it was, um, I mean, Georgie and I had a, a great time over there and, you know, even, excuse me for her finding work i mean that was a uh, that was another yeah. challenge initially we thought you know i'm, I'm sponsored it'll be easy for her to you know get a, a sponsor and i don't know if you remember but um but um one of the financial sponsors that we had um or business partners over there at the time oh granite 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 no 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 no, no. that was no before that bank do you remember? Oh yeah, B A B A N C. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So Georgie had got a job with them. They'd promised her the visa, everything. She flew back to Australia for the meeting with the consulate. The day before the meeting with the consulate, they called her and said, "Oh, actually, we don't have a job for you." And she's already back in Australia, ready to get the visa to go over. So oh, I don't. I didn't remember it working out that way. Oh, mate, it was it was pretty horrific at the time. But anyway, yeah. so there was there was definitely some challenges but no we were we were committed to to have a real go over there and and you know really wanted to to grow the network and and sort of the um and and the i mean the the good thing was that there was a really good group of people over there already um and it was just a case of trying to identify and find them and it's um no question there's no shortage of agents or agencies in the US it's just a case of finding the right ones that you want to be on the journey with what what's the thing reflecting back on your time here mate and now um sort of leaning into the north american element and the angle what did you love about the us real estate opportunity and what did you hate i loved um that the opportunity just seemed so big and there were so many people to talk to and, and options i probably the thing i disliked the most was the lack of full time agents that were really in there having a crack like it was very, very it's so different so in australia if you're an agent you're you're not doing anything else like you're full-time you're in there's only one side of the commission that you get paid on so you're not sort of waiting for a buyer to you know eventually introduce you and get connection and paid on one day like you to be an agent it is i mean everywhere is competitive but people are like 
sellers that don't even know they're selling will be getting called by 20 or 30 agents a month you know yeah. like it's yeah. it's super competitive over here so um the 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 full timeness was was different over there and that was that was a little frustrating um and i just think the some of the inefficiencies but that was one of the greatest opportunities because yeah. you know with what you're doing with auction over there it actually made it so much easier to get deals done and give feedback to sellers and reduce days on market and all those things so so that to me was a really cool thing because we we actually had something that was so unique in the u.s market that was actually making a difference and helping agents make more money and have better careers so so to me that was a, a really exciting thing to be a part of if you were entering the US marketplace again, mate, and you were coming in here with second time around, what would you do differently from day one? Great question. I'd probably um I'd probably look for an acquisition with a big group that you could then work auction into and build off the back of that. Um, yep. because I think if you found and it's hard because who's the right group? What do they want? Time like it, it it's easy to say. But I think you would um, need you would need management control as well because management, if they didn't understand it, you and I discussed this a million times yeah. over is that one of the only reasons that we've been somewhat successful with auction within North America and folding it in is because we get to make the decision on the success because yeah. people's expectation of auction is like there's a million people standing at the front of the home when it's not. It's about processing that inventory as yeah, you're correct. aware. And most management or people that were at the leadership position wouldn't wouldn't have probably warranted that or, or seen that at the time. But yeah, that, no. that's interesting you say that. Yeah, yeah, because I think I think the more people that are exposed to it, like you know, every single person that actually goes through it and understands it, like, oh, this makes sense. I'm making more money. I'm listing easier. It's actually it's actually a vehicle that's helping. And 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 the reason it makes such a difference over there is just because of you know you're not waiting for another agent when you know what are they doing and they actually and it always baffled me how and I know I know over there a lot of people you sort of think that. How can you have, um, how's a conflict of interest when you're representing a seller and you're sort of got the buyers as well? But I just can't get my, I still can't get my head around how a seller is paying a commission for a buyer's agent who is trying to get a discount for the buyer on the property. To me, it just doesn't well, it's, make well, sense. It's, it's interesting you say that because it's a huge lawsuit within the industry at the moment that's going through all of North America. It's class action, just got class action status. And and mate, if it comes in, if it if it comes off, it unravels the entire industry based on that premise that you just said. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Options so, work, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. There you go. But mate, I, I, it's it's a it was a loaded question because you know at the end of the day, this is such a big beast to tame. It is. But th but being a big beast to tame, what have you taken? What what do you think it did for you going back to Australia after being in the US for for the amount of time? Did, what what positives did it sort of influence on you um, going back into the Australian real estate market? Um. I don't know. I, I think um, one of the things that kind of has come up, and, and I think it's going to be really important in the market that we're going into, but is around particularly coming into the office here is um, the the care and the, I don't know, time put into actually to create something in a, in a culture because essentially that's what it is. Like people are wanting, people are part of a group because they want to belong or be part of something. And and even, even you know, if you've got a lot of independent groups, they're all wanting to be part of, like there's, there's a, a certain element of, um, you know, people want to be part of groups. Um, and, and I think that the investment and time that goes into actually um, caring about a team and people is, is, paramount and i think we did that pretty well over there just in the way that we got people together connected but it's probably highlighted it more so being in in this business is um really when you actually care about people and and from a leadership perspective the amount that you do for them like you genuinely have to really want them to succeed and i think that that yeah i, I don't think that changes whether you're, um, you know, selling real estate in North America or any or here, and that's not a difference in kind of the way the market operates. But to me, in terms of looking at business and particularly the leaders that are succeeding, are the ones that are actually genuinely caring about the people within their business and how they can help them grow. So if we change gears and we talk more about the business that you've gone to um, and now you're running and now you're a partner of, you know, at the end of the day, you stepped into a business where the founder of that business is still in that business. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, the cultural sort of lines had been set with the way that the business was operating. So yeah. therefore, you probably had to be relatively cautious when you went in there, not as a partner, not to ruffle too many feathers or, or how did you go with the entry into that business, mate? 
I always think um, it's an old, it was actually an old Stephen Nell thing, but people don't care about how much you know until they know about how much you care. Um, so for me going into, and it was like when I was, you know, a, a young guy going into um, Harcourts in New South Wales. Um, again, when I went over to North America and coming into here, it was the same approach every time and that there's no point me coming in saying how I think should be things should be run. I mean, I was coming into what was already one of the best real estate businesses in the country. So for me to come in here and throw out all these ideas and different ways of doing things, I think would be pretty naive. So it was, it was all about just sort of learning and getting to know what was actually happening and then finding ways that I could um, add value to the team. Um, and, and so that's always been my approach. And, you know, Jason Boone, he often talked about it when he was talking about, you know, when he was coming out of a pretty rough patch, um, you know, when, when he was with McGrath, got the job with Richardson and Wrench with a couple of mates of his, he, he said he was pretty much un, unemployable um, at that point of his career. And all he wanted to do was to provide value. So yeah. I looked at that and I, my only thought was, what can I do to help provide value to the business I'm in? Um, and that's what I did. I just tried to, you know, not not everyone wants um, you know, someone to come in and be like, "Hey, hey, I'm I'm new in here. Let's let's rip in. I've got to, you know, let's set some KPIs." You know, that's that's not really my style. It's about just trying to get to know people and find out what they want and assist where they need help. Um, yep. One of the things that has helped, you know, tremendously from my, um, you know, auctioneering background, um, Dane was doing all of the auctions for um, the Coastal Group. Um, I started um, probably, I don't know, three or four months in, started doing, you know, a few auctions on Saturdays and and then picking them up. And we've transitioned that now that I'm I'm doing the all the auctions for the for the group, which is which has been good. So to me, that's a really good way to um to to add value with a team. Not that every agent is an auction agent, but you know, it just means that you're um sort of on the coal face and you're um, you know, at listing presentations or you, you're working actively in a lot of negotiations. So you've got a really good feel for what's in the market and how things are going. So, so to me, that's been a, a really good, um, a really good approach. And I mean, as, as an auctioneer, um, you know, your clients are agents, yep. um, which is exactly the same philosophy as the way that this business has been set up, that agents are the client. So yeah. we do everything that we can and, you know, often talk about it um, that, you know, Dane often says that we're, we essentially are a hotel for real estate agents. So we want to make sure that when someone checks in, we provide them an absolutely impeccable service um, and experience that they never want to never want to check out and that's through concierge it's through um, marketing it's through world-class administration which is you know going over and above what what most um, can even think they're going to get people that come over just can't quite believe the, the amount that we offer in in that respect um, you know technology is everything that we do and package up to make sure that people have a really good experience um, you know here at, at coastal and that that's kind of goes hand in hand um, with being an auctioneer I think because you truly understand that so so mate let for the people that aren't familiar with coastal can we just run through some numbers so that they have a good understanding um yep. you know harcourt's coastal as um is the office that you guys have in broad beach is the number yep. one office for harcourt's internationally and it is also yep. recognized as the number one independent office within all of australia for any brand um, yep. based on the production that comes out of that individual location now can you just walk us through the like the overall picture of what coastal looks like for those that are that, that are yep. unfamiliar Yep. So, so we've got um, well four locations, but five offices. Um, so, Broadbeach is the the headquarters. Um, so, in Broady, we've got all the property management sort of operates out of here. We've got on level one our sales team. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've got um, about forty five agents in in Broady. Um, and then on level three, we've got a commercial division, um, and which has got about um, eight or nine agents now, and our essential services. Um, so, essential services essentially runs um the runs the offices and providing additional value to agents outside of what the administrator does which is payroll hr contracts marketing tech um so that's all kind of done out of out of the one central location um okay. then we've got um an office in paradise point um yep. so paradise point um has about um 17 agents up there um, no partners, just Dane and I with that one. And then we've got um, Rabina. Um, we've got a, a partner in there, James Massey. Um, that uh, office has um, about you know, 15, 16 agents as well. Um, and then recently opened in uh, in Palm Beach, um, which um, which has a couple of partners who are 
um, you know, top agents, they're still doing what they're doing in listing and selling. Um, and we're kind of running and, and providing all of the um, the additional services for that office. So so that's down in, in Palmy. So yeah, four locations, five offices because of commercial, obviously. So then if we look at, so number of agents totally, mate, would you say, what, how many did we say? It's about 95. And then with um, with PAs and associates, about one 120. Um, and then total team is um, is about 170. 170, including the ancestral services, the administration support, and the assistants Property and the associates yeah. and everything. Okay, great. Yeah, so it's absolutely. a it's a pretty large it's a pretty large organization. When I say pretty large, it's pretty it's huge. But yeah. but but realistically, mate, what are the numbers that it's churning out? What is the total GCI that you guys did um, mate, last year in 2022? Yeah, so 2022 um, was about, and that was slightly down on the the prior year, but it was about 40 mil. Okay, and then yeah. and then what was the year previous to that? Oh, it was closer to fifty. Yeah. So so the the thing that I the thing I want to really talk about so now that was about two and a half billion in in sales. Two and a half billion. So which is yeah. which is just that's it's gigantic as far as a real estate network or real estate group. They're yeah. a very about, little that I compare. Think just under two billion at the moment, or about two when you look at the last rolling twelve months. So, so mate, is there any, like, is there, is there anyone else? I don't know of any other group in Australia that's doing that type of volume out of that type of size of offices, like, or that many agents. I don't, like, there might be a couple of independents in Victoria that might, or something along yeah, those lines. Yeah, a couple of but... Victoria, possibly in, in Sydney. There's a couple of big ones down there um, yeah. as, as a group. Um, yep. But yeah, as an independent office standalone, I know Broad Beach is, um, yeah, is, is the, the biggest. Yep. Now, now the thing I want to talk about though, is that if you were to look at, coastal from an outsider's perspective and not on an internal perspective is that I look at it and I go, it's an auction business. It's a full auction business. You know, you guys just auction real estate. Like it's, it's, it's go, 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 go. But maybe that's a little bit more of the perception that you guys, do you, do you put that perception out in the public of auction or how does you, how does your auction culture work? How many auctions did you guys do last year? Yeah. I mean, not at all. I mean, we're doing about 500 auctions a year. Um, so it's on average, I say it's about excuse me it's around 10 a week that i'm doing sometimes a bit more like i've got um in room auctions we do every tuesday in our paradise point office um yep. and every wednesday in our broad beach office we run those at 11 a.m on a tuesday yep. and wednesday um and they're just every week so we we kind of don't do any big events or anything like that it's just a just a part of what we do um a couple of weeks ago we had i think 12 on a wednesday um today i've got three um mm -hmm. so it just it just really it really varies and we just kind of have it there as something that's just continually there but it's not not something that you know where saying to everyone right we've got to we've got to pitch for this one big event and then drive that hard we just kind of believe it's a, a part of everything that you know something that we do um and then on sites we do on on saturdays so and that can vary i think this weekend i've got seven um last weekend i had one um a few sold prior um a few withdrawn just uh you know different different things in the market um but um yeah so that that kind of varies but in terms of us being an auction agency i would say that we are not um we've got a lot of agents that that have really good process and, and work really well and don't use auction and that's fine we, we don't push that at all um but if ever i mean it's like anything if ever we've got a, a seller that's um a little tough around price or we're trying to um you know trying to find a way to sort of you know win a listing or give advice just with the background that dan and i have it does steer down the path of auction typically um but that's certainly not not something that is is forced or or you know there's no kind of set requirement or target that we have that we're trying to get a certain number of auctions every month not at all um it's just around helping helping um you know agents and and you know as you know in every market there's there's a place for it um you know yeah. the market that we're coming into now um i mean it is being propped up a little bit because listings are still very very tight um which i believe is sort of keeping prices at a at a pretty pretty good level um but as we get more pressure and i, I believe that we are going to see well like every market goes through a cycle listings are tight now they won't be forever um when we start to get more listings and there's probably going to be more downward pressure on pricing then i think auction is going to play a really really important important role um, because it actually helps uh, as you know with um, with education on on giving real market feedback on on what the buyers are actually saying um, yeah because unless you know sort of pricing you know having having a number that a, a seller wants to get is great and we want to get them the most but by putting a number on a price that's going to have them sit there for two months 
is that really going to be the best interest of the seller if the market's declining? You know, you actually want to get the feedback sooner so they can make a decision that's going to help them get on with their lives, you know, and, and accept where the market is. So so to me, that the market that we're coming into is going to be, um, you know, it's going to be, uh, auction is going to be very important. So, so I want to come back to the marketplace because I find it. I, I think it's interesting to talk about how you're navigating through that with with the people that you have in your business. But let's say that we went through the top twenty or top ten agents within Coastal. Let's go through the top ten. Could you tell us whether they're an auction agent or a or a traditional agent? Because where I'm trying to go here, Rob, is that I want to point out that this is the best business in Australia. And you know, I obviously often pitch that Australia and New Zealand mainly do a lot of auctions in the major metropolitan areas. You know, it's a very yeah. big percentage of the tra- transactions that they do but your business has sort of levitated to this auction culture but then you're not pushing it in any way shape or form you're not jamming it down the guy's neck you're certainly mentioning it at the right times but people are naturally levitating to the process when available to them but when it's a more difficult situation and they're certainly you know needing to needing to educate or, or push a seller in order to come to market if you were to go through the top 10 yeah who were, who's an auction agent and who's not i reckon there'd be seven seven of our top 10 would be auction agents. Yeah. And, and yeah. it just, and, and some of them, and it's funny, the ones that aren't are very, very structured and run their business like an auction, just without having the auction itself. What do you so see the biggest resistance to auction? That they process. But I mean, that's the thing. Like our top 10, they're, they're all doing volume. And I think unless you've got a really, unless you're really process driven, it's very hard to run volume. So I think auction actually enables, you know, it's it's almost like you've got to be more structured to run a high volume non-auction business than what you do to run a, a, a high volume auction business because auction forces the structure. So, and that, that's where it's kind of forcing that you've got four weeks, you've got to get feedback from the market, you've got to present it to the sellers, you've got to have the auction day in a month, which is going to, you know, give the feedback. So, so that almost gives you that, that platform that if you're, if you're not a really structured person, auction gives you the platform to actually run structure. And again, it's generating stock off the back of that as well, because you're, you're doing your invitations to open homes, you're knocking on doors around the, to get them to the first open, you're telling them to come to the open, you're telling them um, that the auction's coming up, you're inviting them to that, you're telling the neighborhood about the results. So there's that constant communication in your local community, which is then helping generate, you know, business off the back of that and deliver a, a good result to the client. So the agents in your business that are like top performers that don't do auction, what's their what's their protest to auction if they do have one? They just I don't know. They just haven't kind of gravitated towards it, or they've done a couple and it hasn't really worked for them. Um, I, I'm thinking of the, I mean, there's three um, in our top ten that are that run exceptional businesses and they don't use auction, and they are selling high volume. Mm -hmm. Um, and they are just incredibly process driven. They understand their market back to front. Um, they, I think with their experience, they're not going into a seller and sort of promising them a number that they know that they're not going to achieve. Like they actually know what they need to price it at to sell. And because they've got the experience, the credibility, they're doing so many sales in that marketplace, sellers know and believe and already have the trust in them that they just follow the process and it works. So, so for them, um, they haven't gravitated or needed to to use auction and and that's yeah. fine like yeah and 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 some of them they just don't like it yeah so that's fine it, whether it be it. the pressure whether it be the pressure of auction day but it's it's interesting I, I was i was thinking about it the other day when i when i was back in australia recently um and we got to come in and see your office and a few of the others but you're thinking to yourself in this culture and, and a couple of the american guys that i was with go why would why would why would anyone not auction here and the answer that i I automatically came to without even thinking of it really was usually with agents that we had in our offices, when someone didn't do auction, it was because their biggest competitor was an auction agent. Mm. It, it, like yeah. like their biggest competitor that was always breathing down their neck, they tried to use it as a point of difference that they weren't going to force auction down the throats of their the 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 sellers that they were going in the listing presentation with. And that's where they they'd built this resilient toward re- resistance towards auction. But yeah. I, I, I guess that coming back and and looking at your business the way that it is now made and being one of the best businesses that is in Australia hands down yep. you guys are coming into a little bit more of a tighter marketplace where you know if there's any fractures in any of your agents they're just going to be accentuated in a marketplace that that gets tougher what are you doing as a leader in order to get them to brace themselves for uh, maybe a, a possible different difficult market 
I mean, we've always prided ourselves on having the most profitable agents in the industry. And I think that we've got that because of the level of support that we offer through administration. I would say that a lot of people have joined us and they've had part-time PAs. Um, they've come on board to us and said, we're actually getting more out of the administration than what we had the part-time PA or, or the PA. What do they do now? You know, like, so we, we don't, when someone's growing a team and they put on a PA, it's not to do admin. Admin stays with the administrator and it's for, for growth. So um, one of the things that I think at the moment is, um, you know, I was looking at most suburbs across the coast. Prices are off about 10%, volume's down about 30 um, So, and that was, that's not that we've gone from, you know, if you actually have a look at the numbers, it was an abnormal spike that we had in volume. It was just a, a shot of adrenaline that is, is not going to be seen again for some time. Um, so we're kind of, we are down down on traditional levels, but not much. We're just down on what has been an unusual, um, you know, just a, a, a crazy couple of years. So I think if if agents or teams have been putting on big teams and those teams aren't being productive, then it's around making sure that we're, you know, making the making sure that the agents remain profitable. And part of that is taking back the reins and actually calling the people and, and not outsourcing or and and the most dollar productive activity that you can do is talk to people that are potentially looking to sell real estate so if you're outsourcing that which is the most important thing that you can be doing in your business then often the result isn't coming and you're kind of wondering you know I've, but i'm making 10 times more calls with these other people but why am i getting the result because they're not as good they haven't had the experience they don't pick up the things on the phone so getting the cut through isn't going to be at the same level um so i think that's going to be a really important thing to to guide through i mean i i saw it was a um a, um a post, I think Tom Ferry, I just saw it on this morning. It was like 66,000 agents have less, left the industry um, this year. Um, and the other part of that post that he said something about, you know, if you're still running your 2021 playbook in 2023, you are going to be in for a rude shock. And it is so true. Like you've actually got to be adapting to what is going on in the market. I don't, at the moment, stock is tight. Buyers are still there because there's not a lot of stock. I think we are going to see a shift where once, I mean, different in the US when you've got your 30-year fixed rates, that's going to create a bit of a buffer. Um, typically, we have two to three-year fixed max. Um, a lot of the people that fixed at 1.99% are rolling off in the next six months. So we're going to start to see the impact of mortgage. You know, Sorry, did you say 1.99? Did you say 1.99? 1.99%. <laughs> That's rude. That's just absolutely. Yeah. That's free and that's, money. That is actually and that, free that's money. That's going to be sort of seven seven percent now. We just had another increase last um uh, um well this month. So there's there's definitely going to be you know the there's going to be a bit of a change. I would have thought. And when when we've got a lot of stock on, then it's going to be a real case of you've actually got to get deals together. You've you've got to make sure that you're looking after your buyers um because they're they're not going to be as um abundant as what they are now. Not that there's really. Buy numbers are certainly down. It's just that stock levels are, are, are making sure that there's still, um, still, um, you know, really good demand. It's simple supply and demand. Like if, if yeah. you just haven't got the supply, um, you know, it's going to drive demand. So I think once the supply increases, then 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 we're going to see a bit of a different market. But it's it's adapting to that and, and making sure we're making changes on the fly and you know, looking at businesses and and you know, individual businesses within our business and making sure that they're you know on, on ready for that. Well, mate, I final question for you as you roll out the podcast is that what does coastal look like in five years? Oh, I don't know. Dane and I aren't very good at um aren't very good at big uh big big plans. We've got a we've got a pretty big goal that we're um we're sort of shooting towards, but we just kind of look at it. We just wanna we just wanna um keep um you know, it isn't it isn't it's kind of funny with growth and there's stages and you kind of for us at the moment, this market that we're in now, the the big focus is making sure that we we retain really profitable agents in the business so we want to make sure that our agents that we've got are doing well um we don't just have a goal that we need to grow for the sake of it we want to make sure our people are growing and and that we've got a really good base once we've got that then then we'll grow and and you know the not to say that we're not talking to a number of good agents out there that are potentially you know looking at, at coming on board because we always are but it's about making sure that we we do that with the right people in the right markets when when the timing's right so there's um yeah it's not a um we're, we're not we don't sit down and do annual business plans quarterly check-ins and five years sort of you know we just we, we kind of got a long-term vision and we just kind of know that we need to do the things every day to get there. Wasn't it a hundred million GCI? Yeah, that's it. So, so it, it's sure funny actually. Oh, well, Hey, look, you're halfway there, mate. But, um, yeah. but I get, but I guess that, I guess that 
the funny part about it is, is that as soon as that question exited my mouth, I'm like, oh, that's a very corporate question because like, yeah. you know, we're, we're all like, you obviously experienced the business planning processes that we all went through and all of that type of stuff to go into an environment where you and Dane don't do one-on-ones. Don't get me wrong. You will, if you, if they want you to, and whatever it may be, you don't do one-on-ones, you don't do business planning, you don't do We do a lot of stuff. one-on-ones, but not scheduled not scheduled. Okay. So they're just on the fly and they're check-ins. And, you know, to me, and that's been a big thing because I, I was very much a believer in, you know, yeah. you've got to do your annual plan, your quarterly check-ins. I don't know, for a real estate business and real estate agents, things happen too quickly to plan for three months out. It's all well and good yeah. to have a goal and break down the numbers. But if you're not there present, relevant to help get a d- deal done today, that could then snowball into two or three others that come in the next two weeks off the back of the result and momentum that creates, then you're missing the whole, like it doesn't matter what you're planning to do in a year, you need to get this done now. So it is very much, uh, um, there's there's two there's two parts of it. There's the right now business and you've got to be really um, nimble and, and um, agile to be able to make sure that you're taking advantage of that. There's long-term goals and farms and different things that you can work on. But if you, there's, it's like the old, the old, I was having a chat with one of the agents yesterday and he's got a, a marketplace that he's really wanting to grow market share in, but at the moment he's getting listings that are, aren't in that area. He said, do I kind of push them away and just wait for, you know, what's going here? And I said, well, no, because if you're, if you just, if you just focus on that market that you're trying to go into, if you don't get any sales in there and what you're doing is going to work, no question, that long-term stuff's going to come off. But if you don't get traction in there for two years and you turn away all the other results, it doesn't matter how good your farm's going to be because you're not going to make it. So you've yeah. got to make sure that you're looking after the right now business with the other stuff. So it's it's and that's where I think it's really important that that don't don't take the lack of um um planning or structured one on ones in the business for a lack of understanding on what's going on. Like we we are pretty across a lot of the deals and negotiations oh, that are course. happening at any one time. So it's it's just being really present or rather it's than It's being just it's being really connected. Life. It's being really yeah. connected on a day to day basis on everything that's going on in the business. Like yeah. I've often found that the big the best connection that I have with an agent is remembering that we're gonna talk to a seller about possibly selling a week ago and being, Hey, how'd you go with that yeah. twenty eight Smith Street? And they're like, Oh, you oh, Oh shit! You remembered. Okay, and like, one, of, like, one of the things I think is sometimes when you have something planned and booked in, and you know you've got that coming up, you kind of think, "Oh well, I'm doing that next week. I don't need to worry about what's going on now." Hmm. And it kind of like you, you kind of, I don't know, you, you're not relaxed, but you, you kind of think, "Oh well, that's coming up. I'll deal with anything they need then, rather than what do we actually need to deal with right now." Yeah. Yeah. No. Great point, mate. Thanks for joining us on Rethink Real Estate, Rob. It's great to okay. jump on and chat, chat, chat all things USA with somebody that gets it. Yeah, mate. I'm I'm honoured to be on the uh, on the podcast. I've been uh, <laughs> I've been watching it. It's uh, you're doing a great job. So, no, nah, more than absolute pleasure. Thanks for joining me, mate. Thank you. So about 75% of our audience hasn't liked, followed, or subscribed to our podcast. It would mean the world to us and it would help this podcast more than you know to expand our reach if you were to like, follow, or subscribe on any of the platforms that you're watching or listening on. Thanks again.